so yeah, I'm going to talk about my PhD work on preference learning for interactive autonomy. So in our daily lives, we often encounter situations where we have to interact with other agents. Like traffic is a great example. In traffic, each driver has their own objectives, and we do not have a centralized controller that decides their actions. Obviously, we cannot behave like we are the only agent in traffic. That would easily cause accidents as we are ignoring the other agents. But it's also not enough to just be aware of others' presence in the environment. Because, for example, this car could cut in front of us and the car behind could decide to accelerate and we would have no chance to avoid a collision. But this no normally doesn't happen in real life. Because what we do is to understand and predict what the other agents are doing. For example, we can usually anticipate when another vehicle is going to change lanes. And traffic is only one of the many relevant settings. Another interesting setting that we see this often is sports. So let me show you an example. In this video, I want you to focus on this player. Okay, let's watch. So he successfully bumps the ball. And at this moment, it seems obvious that this other player is going to spike and will try to make a score. But actually, look at our player. He just bumped the ball, and yet he's preparing to jump again, even though he cannot touch the ball before someone else hits. Now look at what happens next. Oops, that was quick. Let's watch it in slow motion. You can see that the other player sets the ball to our player instead of spiking, and our player spikes the ball and makes the score. Like overall, we are seeing a great cooperation between these two players in this video. And this is really the key moment here. This player has two options. He will either set the ball or spike. Similarly, our player is going to either wait or jump. And these players have trained together so many times that he actually predicts his teammate is going to set the ball. So he decides to jump and they make a great score together. But in human-robot interaction and in multi-robot systems, this is very challenging. Because as opposed to the volleyball example, we often do not precisely know the objective of other agents. For example, which cup they are going to pick in this case. Or even if we know their objectives, we do not know how good they are at optimizing these objectives. In my research, my goal is to enable AI agents to achieve this opponent or partner modeling. The agents must be able to anticipate other agents' actions so that they will better optimize their policies. And for this, we need algorithms that can learn the objectives of the agents. To achieve this, I focus on three fields. First, I study human-robot interaction because if we want robots to effectively help or collaborate with humans, we need them to learn humans' objectives. But the agent we are trying to learn doesn't need to be a human, so I also look at multi-robot or multi-agent systems in general. And eventually, when we learn these other agents' objectives, we want this information to be useful for our robots in various ways. For example, we want to use those models while planning for our robots. In my PhD, I did research in these three fields. And today, I want to give an overview of my research about how we learn humans' objectives. At the end, I will also briefly talk about how modeling others uh, help robots in multi-agent systems. And even though I will mostly focus on human-robot collaboration tasks, the ideas I will talk about have applications in other domains, including recommendation systems, exoskeleton gate optimization, or traffic routing for congestion management. Okay, let's start. So I'm going to divide this anticipating and utilizing others' actions task into three categories. First, I'll start with learning methods, where the goal is to learn humans' objectives based on the information we acquire from them. And this information can be in different forms, such as comparisons or rankings, or etc. Then I will move to the second section that I call elicitation. The idea here is that the robot can elicit the information from the human, so we have a two-way interaction now. This elicitation is an active learning problem. And finally, as I said earlier, I will show some examples of how robots uh, use learned objectives or policies for planning in multi-agent systems. For this, I will look at multi-agent bended uh, problems. So let's start with how we learn other agents' objectives. One very common way to learn objectives is to collect some demonstrations from the agents uh, and then learn a policy or a reward function for them. Like for example, behavioral cloning is one such idea that has been around for more than 30 years now. And these learning from demonstration methods work great in many settings. 
For example, many verbs, including some of ours, use learning from demonstration techniques to learn safe and efficient policies for autonomous cars. But these techniques were usually not enough. In our case, we had to learn multiple different policies and try to optimally switch between them. In some others, additional safety controllers were necessary. So what is wrong with these methods? Why can't we just imitate the human and have a perfect driving policy? One of the reasons for this is human demonstrations are often suboptimal. So to more concretely see uh, why learning from demonstrations may fail, let's take a look at Bayesian IRA. In the setup, we are given a set of demonstrations. These are basically the robot trajectories. And there is a function phi that maps each trajectory to a set of features. For example, here's a robot trajectory where the goal is to reach the notebook on the desk without colliding the obstacle. Here, the features can be, again, as examples, like final distance to the goal, how close the robot gets to the obstacle, its average speed, etc. The assumption is the robot is trying to optimize an objective, and this objective, the reward function we are trying to learn, is a linear combination of these features. So essentially, what I'm trying to do is to learn this weight vector w. Uh, then I should just find the posterior distribution of this weights vector given the demonstrations. I can then take its maximizer or the expectation as my learned reward function. Or I can even use it as a distribution if I need to model uncertainties. So how do we do this? Well, we can use base rule. Here, the first term is just the prior. We can take a uniform distribution for that, or we can incorporate our domain knowledge. Uh, but the important term is the second term, the likelihood term here because it will add the information from demonstrations into the model. And for that, in Bayesian IRL, we first assume the demonstrations are conditionally independent. And also the likelihood of demonstrations come from a noisily optimal human model, the softmax rule in this case. So this final expression here is an unnormalized distribution that we can use as our posterior. So for example, we can just maximize this to find the map estimate of the weights vector. Now, the problem is that the noisily optimal assumption doesn't hold. For example, the trajectory that I'm showing here is the optimal one, but it's definitely not the most likely one because humans will not be able to teleoperate the robot to move as smooth as this. In fact, this robot is just too difficult to control. Here you are seeing my lab mate Andy, who has a lot of experience with this robot, and he's trying to teleoperate it to perform the task but he's having a hard time because this robot arm has seven degrees of freedom. So it's really hard to teleoperate it. Also, the problem is not specific to teleoperation. In fact, humans are far from being optimal decision makers. There is this work where they showed humans actually do not like their own driving. They think it's too aggressive. And more recently, we showed that humans are consistently making suboptimal decisions when they encounter situations that involve risk. And if we are not able to give good demonstrations, then how can we even hope to learn from these demonstrations? So we need a better way of learning objectives. Our idea is to use comparative feedback to learn the objectives accurately. When I say comparative feedback, that can be simply comparisons or richer forms such as rankings. Uh, let's start with comparisons. So what is comparison data? First, the robot shows two trajectories to the user, and then we ask the user whether she prefers trajectory A or trajectory B. Her response gives us information about her underlying reward function. Let's add the comparison data into the Bayesian IRL uh, framework. In this new setup, we will have a second data set for comparisons, uh, where each data point consists of two trajectories and a user response. Um, and this will affect our posterior as well. First, uh, we are now given two data sets. And assuming the conditional independence of demonstrations and comparisons, we can factor out the likelihood of the comparison data set. And similarly, we can expand the likelihood of each user response. In the final step, we again make the noisy uh, optimal assumption to model how humans give their responses to the comparison queries. But importantly, this assumption doesn't hurt us here because it's not the humans who teleoperate the robot anymore. The robot is generating its own trajectories, and then the human user is just choosing which of them they prefer. We compared how well the robot achieves the task when it learns the objective using both demonstrations and comparisons. 
Here, the data collected for two different algorithms had the same convergence rate in simulations. So in the left one, we have many demonstrations, and in the right one, we have only a few demonstrations and some comparison data. As you can see, the Bayesian IRL robot tries really hard to avoid the obstacle, but it, but it fails to achieve the actual task and gets stuck in a weird configuration. On the other hand, the robot trained with comparisons eventually reached the goal while also not hitting the obstacle. Okay. With that, we now know how to learn objectives using demonstrations and comparisons. And I've been doing a lot of work on this. To give you an overview of different possibilities in learning from comparisons, I will very briefly talk about our works in this domain. First, the robot can decide the comparison questions it wants to ask the user. So we developed various active learning techniques to optimize these questions for higher data efficiency. However, one issue with active learning is that we are optimizing each and every query. This is usually very slow and it's not parallelizable. So we also worked on batch active learning where we optimize a batch of queries at the same time. We then focused on richer forms of comparative feedback. For example, we proposed scale feedback to allow users to indicate uh, how much they prefer one trajectory over the other. With this form of feedback, we were able to learn faster because the user responses contain more information. Another form of comparative feedback we looked at is hierarchical queries. In this form, we let the system start from an initial state and ask a comparison question. Depending on the user's response, we let the next comparison question start from that state. And in this way, we capture some simple non-stationarities in the reward functions we are learning. Um, and very recently, we released a Python library that allows playing with many of the things I've just described. You can try different feedback types, active learning optimizations, batch methods, etc. If you think this could be useful for your work, let me know and we can discuss offline. Um, all these works around learning from comparative feedback enabled us to solve various problems in different domains, such as mixed autonomy traffic. We are able to learn humans' price latency trade-off using the choices they make on ride-hailing apps, uh, such as Uber and Lyft, because these choices are essentially comparison data. And together with the information about the traffic network, we use these learned trade-offs to optimize prices and reduce congestion while still serving the same number of passengers. Uh, then the pandemic happened and we all started uh, staying at home. So traffic congestion was already gone. Uh, but with reopening, much fewer people have been using public transportation because of the infection risk. And this is actually bad because it means more people start using their personal cars, causing even more congestion. So we also included the risk of infection in our traffic model and showed how authorities can set the taxi or train fares to best balance the trade-off between congestion and infection risk. And finally, we looked at how we can learn more complex reward functions. For example, what if the reward is not linear? Using Gaussian processes, we are able to learn such rewards from comparative feedback. And this enabled us to use our learning algorithms in exoskeleton gate optimization. Here, the patients cannot possibly give demonstrations and the rewards are not linear in gate preferences. Besides, testing different gates is very demanding for the patients. So data was really, really expensive. Our active learning approach that use comparisons have enabled us to quickly learn their preferences. Okay, so that's an overview of our works on learning from comparisons. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on another uh, work on learning multimodal rewards using comparative feedback. So let's recap the original problem we were solving with comparison feedback. We have a user who wants to perform a task, and the user has an internal reward function that he wants the robot to optimize. However, the robot doesn't know this reward function. For example, let's consider this scenario. Here, we have the red autonomous car who wants to make a left turn. So it starts turning, but then it realizes the blue car, which is coming from the opposite direction and was previously occluded behind the red truck. Depending on its policy, the autonomous car may make different decisions now. If it's using a reward function it learned from a timid driver, the car may stop and give way to the blue car. It could avoid an accident in this way. Um, okay, this is our first scenario. As a second scenario, we could think of a case where the data come from an aggressive driver. And in this case, the autonomous car could try to complete its turn before the blue car reaches the intersection. This is another way of uh, avoiding the collision. In both of these cases, our autonomous car was using data from one of the drivers. 
And there has been many works that focus on learning such unimodal functions, including most of the works I've described. But what if the data come from multiple users who have different reward functions and our robot doesn't know any of them? It doesn't even know who provided the data. In the driving example, this would be a scenario where the autonomous car was trained using data from both drivers. In such settings, we cannot really use standard learning from comparison techniques because the car would have an accident while trying to find a policy that's close enough to both drivers. And although there have been many works for the unimodal reward functions, learning multimodal rewards from comparisons was not studied. Let me explain why multimodal rewards are more difficult with an example. Here, the fat robot wants to learn how and which shelf to place the banana. Perhaps a user comes in and says they prefer the first trajectory over the second trajectory. Fetch can handle it because it knows how to learn unimodal rewards. However, if a second user with different preferences shows up, then Fetch will fail. In fact, it's doomed to fail. Let me explain why with a numerical example. So we have two trajectories, Xi1 and Xi2. The first user comes in, let's say their reward for the first trajectory is two and one for the second trajectory. We again model the user's comparison response with the softmax model. So the probability that the user chooses a trajectory is proportional to the exponential of its reward. This model would give us these probabilities. Now, we also have a second user with different rewards and preferences. Let's say the first user provides 20% of the data and the second user provides 80%. Combining these, our robot would observe a data set that's 24% in the favor of the first trajectory and 76 in the uh, second trajectory. Now, the problem is, I can come up with another pair of users whose rewards and preferences are different, such that with different data frequency, they also provide the same data. Now, our robot is only observing these data at the end. So from its perspective, these two settings are indistinguishable. It would have no way of identifying the underlying true rewards. In fact, researchers in ranking theory proved that you can always construct examples where learning multimodal or even bimodal rewards from pairwise comparisons is impossible. So are we done? Well, no, because we can think of some generalizations of the problem. Specifically, instead of learning from pairwise comparisons, Let's say we will learn from rankings of multiple trajectories. So in this work that I'm going to talk about, we are solving the problem of learning multimodal rewards using rankings. And to reiterate, the robot is going to show multiple trajectories to the users, and it will ask them to rank these trajectories from best to the worst. We will have multiple users, each with their own reward function that may or may not be linear, but I will again use uh, W for the parameters of the reward function. Here we will have multiple Ws, one for each user, uh, and the ranking query will then be answered by one of the uh, users with some unknown probability parameterized by alpha. Let's say the first user is going to respond to this query. Our robot, however, doesn't know this. So how does the human answer? Uh, he will first noisily select his best option, so we again have these probabilities that are proportional to the exponential of the rewards, and the user's top choice will be a random sample from this distribution. And next, he will noisily choose his second best option. Now the first option has already been selected, so we drop that, and the user's second top choice will be a random sample from this remaining distribution. Uh, similarly, the process will repeat for the third best option, um, and finally, there will be only one option left, which is the user's worst option. This response model that I described for a single user is known as loose choice axiom, and it's a very standard model for rankings done by humans. Eventually, what our robot observes is only this ranking. It doesn't know which user gave this ranking. It doesn't know probability. Like it doesn't know the probability that this ranking uh, comes from this user. So, from the robot's perspective, we have this user model. It doesn't know alpha, but it observed the ranking. It will start with a prior over both alpha and the user's reward functions. It will then use base rule to update its posterior based on the ranking it observed. This is very similar to what we had in pairwise comparisons. 
Note that this likelihood term is just the response model that I described. Mathematically, we can expand it as follows. First, it's either the first user who responded or the second user. And we already know the first term here and here. Those are just our uh, data frequency uh, ratios. So we can also expand the ranking probability condition on the users. This is again the lowest choice axiom. And we repeat that for the second user too. At the end, we have this full expression for the likelihood of this ranking query. Our robot will perform this posterior update for all the ranking data it has. At the end, it will learn all reward functions. In fact, it will even learn the data frequency parameter alpha. Let me show you some simulation results. On this fetch robot task with bimodal data, we observed that modeling the reward as a unimodal function failed terribly. There were many outliers because the robot was trying to come up with one mode that explains all data. To get nicer graphs, we had to also plot the median error. On the other hand, modeling the reward as a multimodal function using our mixture model gave much better performance uh, and learning, both in terms of the mean and the median. Uh, the results were similar on OpenAI's lunar renders, where we again simulated a uh, bimodal reward. One can also think of other forms of comparative feedback. For example, I talked about scale feedback in the beginning, which allows users to indicate how much they prefer one trajectory over the other. But overall, the point is that these richer forms enable us to learn more general reward functions. And we are, of course, not the only people who thought of utilizing comparative feedback to learn rewards or policies. There was a work that came out of OpenAI and DeepMind in 2017, where they were able to teach some unusual behavior to these simulated robots using comparisons from humans. More recently, researchers at Berkeley proposed the reinforcement learning algorithm that makes use of pairwise comparisons. You might notice that we have been talking about a similar problem here, similar in the sense that we are trying to learn something using comparative feedback. But there's an important difference when we are working with real robots. That is, we cannot really make thousands of queries. That would take too long. So I will now talk about how we can intelligently elicit users' preferences in a way that improves data efficiency. For this, we will develop active learning techniques. One thing in our setup is very important to note. In the case of demonstrations, we have the user giving demonstrations to the robots. We had control over nothing. It's the user who decides the entire trajectory. On the other hand, in preferences, we again have, uh, we again have the robot and the user, but now the robot first shows some, trajectory, some trajectories to the user, and then the user responds. We again have no control over the user's response, but we do have control over what trajectories to show. So we can actually find a smart way of choosing those trajectories to, for example, accelerate the learning of the objective. One way to actively generate these preference queries is the maximum volume removal method. So we had this posterior distribution given some demonstrations and some comparison data. Now, let's say we want to query the user once more for a new comparison data sample. We want to do this in a smart way to improve data efficiency. So we will optimize the trajectories in our query uh, for that. In this maximum volume removal method, we first take some samples from this posterior. For example, let's say we use Metropolis Hastings. And only for visualization, let's say our feature space is two-dimensional and these are the samples from this posterior. These are basically our hypothesis for the reward function. Let's say we now want to assess how good or how informative this query that I'm showing here is. Each of these weight vector samples will tell us about how likely the human uh, is to choose the first or the second trajectory. So here, green bars correspond to the trajectory on the left and the orange ones to the trajectory on the right. If the human chooses the trajectory on the right, then the samples which give more weight to the other trajectory are less likely to be the true hypothesis. So we will update our posterior and we may not sample those vectors again. But looking at this query, it's not really very informative because we almost already know the user's choice. It's very unlikely that the user is going to choose the trajectory on the left. Hence, in expectation, we will not be able to remove a lot of volume from our hypothesis space. Let's instead look at this other query. For this one, our model is more uncertain. Regardless of which trajectory the human is going to choose, we will be able to remove some good amount of volume from the hypothesis space. 
So it makes sense to make this query rather than the previous one. What maximum volume removal objective is trying to do is to evenly distribute the probabilities on the two trajectories. We implemented this active querying approach on some simulations and it significantly improved data efficiency. Here, y-axis shows uh, how well the learned objectives align with the true objectives. So higher is better. And these are on some benchmark environments that include the driving simulator and environments from OpenAI Gym and Mujoko. So it worked great and we can actually uh, but we can actually like further improve this uh, by using other active learning objectives. Let me show you how uh, we do that. So we said this query on the right will give us a good amount of information. It would be even better if it were like this because the volume would be evenly distributed to two trajectories. But let me show you another query. This is a query where we are showing two identical trajectories to the user. Obviously, this will not give any information about the reward function because the user's choice will not reveal anything. But all samples will, of course, predict equal probability of choice for the trajectories because they're just the same trajectory. From the volume removal, object, uh, volume removal objectives perspective, this query is a great one. In fact, this is one of the optimal queries. Volume removal op optimization has many globally optimal solutions, but some of them are just terrible. They don't give any information. The reason for this is the volume removal objective tries to maximize the model uncertainty, but it doesn't take the user's uncertainty into account. As long as the model is uncertain about the outcome, the volume removal objective is maximized. So this approach intuitively made some sense and it was the state of the art, but we realized it works in practice only thanks to the local optimum of the optimization. To solve this problem, we formulated the active querying problem with an information theoretical objective. We said we should maximize the mutual information between the user's response and the belief about the reward function conditioned on the data sets and the query that we are going to make. Equivalently, we can write this objective as the difference between two entropy terms. Here, the first term quantifies the model uncertainty on the user's response because it's conditioned only on the previous data. And we are still trying to maximize this. The second term, on the other hand, is conditioned on the true reward weights W. So it quantifies the user's uncertainty. We are trying to minimize this so that the user responses will be reliable and we can gain some information from them. So going back to our example queries, the model uncertainty is maximum for both queries. However, for the first one, the user uncertainty is also maximum because regardless of the weight sample, the user will have 50% probability of choosing each option. On the other hand, the query on the right, minimizes the user uncertainty because the user will be very certain about their choice given a weight vector w. In the end, our information gain method significantly outperformed the volume removal methods. Uh, and in our simulations, we were able to learn the user's objective within as few as 30 queries as opposed to 100 in the previous results. We also conducted user studies on some simulated environments and in the same robot environment as before. And as you see here, the volume removal objective query is very similar trajectories, whereas the mutual information generates a more distinguishable query. This idea of maximizing mutual information has applications outside robotics too. For example, in my internship at Google, I worked on preference-based learning and recommender systems. Here, the problem is a little different. Let's say we are interested in movie recommendations. We show the user a set of movies and the user still selects their favorite. And at that moment, they can just decide they want to watch that movie. If not, we ask them to tell whether they want more or less of an attribute, such as funniness in this case. And based on their feedback, the process continues. Another uh, important difference is that the user can terminate the session if they don't like our recommendations. So we look at both the success rate and the failure rate. At Google, they previously considered the expected value of information and other metric for optimizing queries. And as you can see in this table, 38% of the users in simulations find a movie they want to watch within first 10 iterations, while 28% uh, terminate the session. But if you maximize the mutual information instead, then we get higher success and lower failure rates uh, because mutual information enables us to find the best movie as quickly as possible. And in this setup, we should also make sure we are not making bad recommendations just for the sake of learning, because that can result in early termination. 
So we developed another method that also maximizes the quality of queries and the results got even better. Overall, the key takeaway is that uh, comparative feedback can be actively co uh, collected and we can use uh, different acquisition functions depending on our objective. So we have seen how active preference-based learning can help us better uh, learn models of human behaviors, rewards, or policies. Lastly, I want to very briefly mention some of our works on online planning and interaction, where we use other agents' uh, learned models to decide our actions in multi-agent systems. But to begin with, let's write down the characteristics of a decentralized multi-agent environment. First, obviously we will have multiple decentralized agents. In the most general form, the dynamics will depend on the actions of all agents. So my observations of the world is affected by other sections too. For example, when two agents stack cups together, just like in this picture, the state of the cup tower depends on both of their actions. If one of them collapses the tower, it will affect the observations of both. We will also have partial observability for each agent because otherwise we can just reduce the problem into a single agent problem with a centralized controller. Again, in this cup stacking example, the agents might be unaware of the weight of the cups that uh, their partner stacked, which may influence their actions. And finally, the policies of the other agent uh, will be unknown to me. And that's actually what I'm trying to learn. To theoretically analyze this, we decided to simplify the problem. And what's the simplest form of reinforcement learning problems? It's probably multi-arm bandits, where we have one agent, the octopus here, and it's trying to find the bandit uh, with the highest expected reward. So every time it pulls a suboptimal arm, it's going to incur some regret. And formally, the goal is to minimize this cumulative regret. This problem covers many characteristics of single agent reinforcement learning, such as exploration versus exploitation trade-off. But the standard multi-arm bandit problem uh, is only for a single agent. Let's now extend it to multiple agents. Uh, so here are the characteristics we wrote down. We said there will be multiple decentralized agents. That's easy. Without loss of generality, let's say we have two agents. And then we said dynamics will depend on all agents. In the bandit setting, this means both agents will take actions, and these actions will join to the term the arm. So in this case, the big octopus will choose the row, and the small one will choose the column. Next, we said there should be some partial observability. This is tricky because bandit problems include a single state. But what we can do is we can restrict the agents to observe the reward with some probability. So they will decide the arm together, but they will not always observe the reward together. This is a reasonable model, especially for robotics, because robots do not often know our preferences perfectly. They observe the reward only when they get a clear feedback. To denote this partial reward observability, let's add glasses to the small octopus. And we also have some partial observability now. I will call these agents the, the leader and the follower, uh, but we could have this sort of partial observability for all agents. It doesn't need to be a two agent setup. Finally, these agents do not know the policy of each other. To put our objective more formally, the team gets a reward that depends on the joint action by the agents. However, the agents may or may not observe this reward based on the partial observability they have. And our goal is to minimize the regrets, which is the expected cumulative difference between the optimal and the actual place. Um, for multi-arm bandits, there are very standard algorithms in the single agent case, such as UCP. What it does is it keeps an upper confidence bound for the expected reward of each arm, and then takes the arm with the maximum upper confidence bound. It's proven that it incurs only logarithmically increasing regret over time in the single agent case. So if you happen to assume a centralized controller, then this problem reduces the single agent and we have this nice logarithmic cumulative regret. This is from a simulation experiment. But if agents independently run this UCB algorithm as if they have the full control over which arm to select in the same simulation, then they get stuck at suboptimal arms and they incur a linearly increasing regret. The problem here is actually easy to see. As an example, let's say the leader thinks the top right arm is the best one and it wants to select that. So it will choose the top row. But the follower has different reward observability. So maybe it will think bottom left arm is underexplored and it will want to pull that. So it will choose the left column. 
At the end, they will end up with this arm neither of them wanted. The best arm will probably not change for the leader, unless we are lucky about this new arm. And the bottom left arm is still underexplored. So the agents will get stuck at this configuration. And this is really the same problem we saw before. Because the agents do not predict what others are going to do, they end up taking very bad actions. We also tried other algorithms like knowledge gradients and some reinforcement learning algorithms, but they all failed to give sublinear regret. But in a recent work, we proved that if one of the agents predicts the actions of the other agent, then we can actually get logarithmic regret. Let me give you a description of this partner error algorithm and the sketch of the proof. In this algorithm, the leader is still going to perform the standard UCB, but it will repeat each action L times. This is only for analysis. In reality, the leader can use other algorithms like Thompson sampling and may not do the repetitive actions and we still get sublinear regret. The follower has a slightly more sophisticated algorithm because it's the one who is going to model the leader and act accordingly. For this, it will first look at the latest action uh, of the leader and based on those latest, uh, latest actions, uh, it will predict this next action in a frequentist way. It will then apply UCB conditioned on this predicted leader action. Again, this is also for analysis and we can replace the UCB here with uh, other algorithms. The idea behind this uh, method is the leader will eventually identify the optimal arm. And when that happens, we do not want the follower to be still exploring because that can make them uh, stuck in local optimize we saw before. So by conditioning the follower on the leader's actions, we reduce the problem to a single agent pendants problem for the follower. And let me give a, a sketch of our proof that shows this algorithm will give logarithmic regret. We first define some good events for each leader action i, such that the number of times the follower will take a suboptimal response will be bounded by the sum of uh, some constants under these good events. In a similar way, we also define the good events for the leader. We define this such that if the good events happen for both agents, for all suboptimal leader actions, then we also bound the number of times the leader will take a suboptimal action. So we bound the number of suboptimal actions by both the follower and the leader under these good events. This means if I define a joint good event for the agents, then I know that the number of suboptimal actions will be bounded under this joint event. I want to look at the expected number of suboptimal team actions until horizon t. So you can think of n here as an action counter. First, I can split this expectation under the joint good event g and its complement gc. For the first term here, we already have the bounds by the definitions of the good events. And the second term here will be less than the expected number of times that the joint good event will not happen. And in fact, we can bound this last quantity by using Chernoff and union bounds as in the proof for standard UCB. In the end, by a proper selection of the constants, the U terms, uh, we show that the number of suboptimal team actions grows only logarithmically. And on simulations, we observe this even when the leader doesn't take the repetitive actions. As you can see, the regret of the partner ever UCB is very close to the centralized controller, which we can think of as a lower bound. We implemented these uh, algorithms on a simple human-robot interaction task where a uh, human and the robot stack burgers together. They were responsible for different ingredients and based on the order they, uh, based on the order they stack, uh, the guests liked the burger or not. For example, the burger on the top right has been liked by four and disliked by five guests up to this point. The human and the robot need to decide together what burger to stack. This is not an easy task because humans are not very predictable. The robot needs to model the human well. We compared the independent and the partner aware versions of UCB algorithm in this setting. And this is what we got. Even in this short interaction, partner aware algorithm outperformed the naive decentralized extension. We also looked at subjective measures. And as you can see, the user's responses have been in favor of partner aware robot compared to the naive UCB robot for all metrics. The difference was statistically significant in three of them. So with this partner aware follower model, we were able to solve the problem in the bandit setting and obtain sublinear regret. Going back to this outline, I talked about learning and elicitation methods to learn other agent objectives and some online planning ideas where we use the learned models. But there are still many open challenges. 
I want to very briefly talk about these future directions that we have been thinking about. I'll start with non-stationary rewards. Remember, in the high-level problem that I'm trying to solve, we have a robot trying to cooperate with some other agents. And I've been suggesting we should, make, uh, we should first make the robot learn and model the other agents. Then it can use these learned uh, models for adapting or influencing other agents. So when I say non-stationary rewards, this is really about the first phase here. In this talk, I've been implicitly assuming that there is an objective the other agent has, and it's not going to change over time. But what if the objectives we are trying to learn are not stationary? For example, if another uh, car aggressively cuts in front of you, do you also start behaving aggressively or do you become more timid? We need models that can capture these dynamic objectives. One idea about this is as follows. We have an agent with some latent state C, and based on this latent state, the agent leaks some information to our robots. It may, for example, give a demonstration, make a comparison. And so far, we have been completing this loop uh, by having our robot interactively query the agent. But this reaction of the robot may actually cause a change in the agent's latent state, which will then affect their objectives. We can then be able to model this latent state C and its dynamics by formulating the problem as a partial observable Markov decision process or by employing some hidden Markov models. However, scalability is still a bit question in such a formalism, and I'm excited to explore developing more efficient and scalable approach for this problem. And for the second phase, I talked about how learned models can help predict others' actions. But if we model other agents, we can actually do more than predicting their actions. For example, what can the robot do when it's interacting with an expert? This is a video from Toyota Research Institute where we are seeing a robot whose only job is to fill a dishwasher. Using the methods I described so far, it can model my actions to avoid colliding with me when I'm around, or it can more optimally place the dishes in the dishwasher. But it can actually go beyond. If it's able to predict my actions, for example, if it's able to anticipate I need to put some groceries in the fridge, then it can actually learn to do it. So we can really use these agent modeling ideas to enhance the capabilities of the robots. One way we can approach this problem is again by simplifying it as a contextual multi arm bandit problem. Here, each context may represent different states of the dishwasher or the fridge, and then we have a human and a robot independently playing this game. Here, the human might be an expert in some context, and what we are trying to do is to have our robot observe the actions of the human to solve the bandit game quickly, even if the human is not always optimal. And we can generalize this approach to multi-agent MDP settings. Finally, there's also an interesting idea on the other side of the spectrum, where the robot is interacting with some inexperienced users. Specifically, ability to model other agents can enable us to realize their weaknesses, and so we can improve them or we can teach them. We are actually seeing such a technology in some domains, such as chess. In chess, computers, chess engines have been better than humans for about two decades. And players have started to use these chess engines to create chess puzzles, better openings, or even lessons. And more recently, there are apps that use artificial intelligence to teach a new language to the users. So I'm interested in whether we can have similar technologies for dynamical systems. For example, can an autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicle teach us to uh, drive better? Or can we replace the training wheels of a bike with some self-balancing system to safely and quickly teach how to bike to beginners? So overall, I'm suggesting we need algorithms that can model other agents for multi-agent systems. One efficient way to do this is to learn their objectives. And I believe this is not only good for partner modeling, but it can enable us to get various other benefits that can enhance the capabilities of both the robots and ourselves. Uh, with that, I'd like to end by saying thank you to all the faculty and research scientists and all the amazing people I've had a chance to collaborate with during my PhD. Thank you. I can take any questions.